Okay, everybody. Praise God today. All right. Yeah, see, we're working. Okay, this is Brother Cedric Rice, New Horizons of the Word of God. Coming to you again, my favorite day of the week, Wednesday, because it's the day that I get to uh, do my, my live broadcast rather with you. God bless you, everyone who's in the sound of my voice. God bless you, and God bless everybody that you know. Amen. Let him bless you and, and your entire circle. I certainly pray for you. Certainly am thankful for you. Certainly am grateful. Amen. And giving all glory and honor to God the Father, my maker, my creator, my Lord, my Savior, and my King on today. Amen. We want to continue on in the series that we have been uh, teaching on for the last two weeks. And this will be the third week and it will be the third chapter of the book of Galatians. And so we're going to get into it. I've got a lot um, that, that I want to cover tonight. And this third chapter, it looked really short when you look at it. But there is so much in here uh, that we can feast on. There is so much word in this chapter of the book of Galatians. Um, there is so much concept in this chapter that it really takes a lot of time to dig it out and to just go over it. And when we do, we can see the depth of the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Because when I really got into this thing, I saw how much that Paul had thought about it. He really put some thought into what he presents. And he really put some thought into the way that he presented this book because he presented it for a very specific purpose. And he was very, uh, for lack of a better word, he was very methodical about what he did because he made his points first. He lied the truth upon truth first. Uh, he made sure that the very first thing he did was he verified the power of God. He verified that it was in fact God who had called him to be an apostle. And then he verified on the foundation of the truth of the word of God. He went and he looked at the foundation of salvation and he brought it out to the forefront because this letter is a letter of rebuke. And in order for him to do so, he wants these Galatian saints to understand why uh, they're headed down the wrong path. And so this letter is a letter of rebuke. But before he does that, he's got to establish the truth. You know, it's one thing, <coughs> excuse me, to just rebuke them. But before he delivers this rebuke, He's got to establish the truth in their minds first. And once he has established the truth, then he can move ahead with the rebuke. You know, and he can rebuke them for straying away from the truth. And you say, well, why does he rebuke them? Well, the whole purpose is that they don't make this mistake again because he's got to make it very clear in their minds the mistake that they've made. And it, it, as long as it's impressed in their mind and they understand and it is clear to them how they have error, uh, then it, they're not subject, hopefully, to error in that way again. Okay, so he established the groundwork in the first two chapters. Okay, and in his rebuke, the whole purpose of his rebuke is to chasten them and the whole purpose whole point of chastening is to correct them to bring them to a closer relationship with God and what he started out doing he gave them truth upon truth upon truth uh, to show them that that false doctrine which they had received was indeed false and he didn't try to show it to them by arguing uh, uh, going back and forth but he presented the truth that's all he did. 
He presented the truth first about the power of God again. He presented the truth first, secondly rather, about who he was and why he was called and that his calling did in fact come from God. And then he, he, he presented the truth of the, the gospel, the fact that we are saved by the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the good news of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we're not saved by works. Okay, let me start with verse 1. We'll do verses 1 through 5 here, but let me start with verse 1. Verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians! Who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? And so he's telling them that you know there is no doubt in your mind, you know that Jesus Christ was crucified, and you know what the purpose of his crucifixion was, but you have allowed somebody to come right in, and confuse you with false teaching amen uh teaching that uh, uh told them that they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved so now he wants to restore them to spiritual soundness he wants to restore them to theological soundness and so now he's rebuking them which is tough love he loves these saints but at this particular time, he's got to present it to them this way to make them understand. They were given the gospel, but yet a false teacher or false teachers were able to easily come in and sway them away from the truth that they knew. And so now Paul has got to do a more thorough job of presenting the truth. But he's also got to uh, rebuke them so that they will know or that they will think about it next time, maybe just a little bit more. Uh, he can't be with them, so he's sending them the strongest letter that he can possibly send. And once again, he's doing this to keep them in the truth. But he talks about the mistake that they made, and it's very interesting that he used the term bewitched. He says, who have bewitched? you let me go back let me see that oh foolish galatians who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth amen very interesting that he uses the word bewitched because uh the bible says that uh uh, uh the, the, the spirit of root witchcraft rather is the spirit of rebellion and so witchcraft or being bewitched originates out of the flesh. It originates out of the, the desire of the flesh to usurp and overrule the things of God. And so therefore someone was able to get these saints to drop down from thinking spiritually to uh, uh, thinking carnally. And when that happened, they were bewitched or deceived. The same way as Adam and Eve were deceived in the Garden of Eden. And we're going to talk about it. And I'm going to show you exactly how Satan used the very same tactics that he used against Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden uh, uh, against the church, the Galatian church or the Galatian saints. Okay. Well, what he did, first of all, with the um, Galatian saints and with Adam and Eve, he dangled a carrot in their face. And that carrot was, well, you know, you can be like God or you can be righteous. And he dangled this thing in their face. He dangled that temptation and that appeals to the flesh. And so in their flesh, amen, Adam and Eve, he told them, all you got to do is partake of this thing or consume this uh, uh, forbidden fruit. Uh, with the Galatians, he said, look, but what you got to do to be like God, now you got to be, you got to get circumcised. Amen. And so they were bewitched into thinking that they could obtain a spiritual thing by an act of the flesh. Praise God. You cannot obtain anything spiritual through the acts of the flesh. It's not possible. It ain't going to happen. Okay, so then 
what the teachers, the foolish teachers did, or what the false teachers did, and what Satan did, the first thing that they did is had to plant doubt in the minds of the people about the source from where they received. Uh, uh, Satan, excuse me, he planted doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve uh, when he told them that God doesn't really want your best interest. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. You know, he, he, he appealed to their flesh and said, well, he knows that if you do this, you'll be like him. And that's not a spiritual appeal. That's a fleshly appeal. That's an appeal to carnality. Amen. But the same thing that these false teachers did when they went into the Galatian church is they blasphemed the apostle Paul. Uh, they blasphemed his, his looks. They blasphemed his actions. They blasphemed his apostleship. They said that he wasn't really an apostle. And, and the first thing Paul had to do when he wrote this epistle to the Galatians, he had to prove to them that he was an apostle so that he could uh, uh, set the stage to get them to listen to what the truth that he was about to present. Okay, he, he used the term foolish also. Now, in the book of Proverbs, the Bible says that the fool believes in his heart that there is no God. And actually, they have fallen and he's going to say it later in the book how they have fallen from grace. But grace is depending on the power of God. Amen. Depending on his work on the cross for our salvation. Foolishness is depending that we can accomplish it through our own flesh or through what we do or fleshly acts that we perform. And so this is why he called them foolish. And then he told them, he said, now, the truth has been demonstrated to you very clearly, but yet and still, you very quickly turned away. And he, it was just kind of hard for him to understand, how can you turn away so quickly when I know that we presented the gospel to you? We presented it to you with signs, amen, and, and signs followed him. They followed his ministry. They followed his presentation of the gospel. But yet and still, they were so easily persuaded to fall for something else and to doubt the gospel of grace. Okay, verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So he said, well, how is it uh, uh, that you were saved how is it that you received the witness of the Holy Spirit in your soul? Was it by something that you did, the works of the law? Was it by your performance? Amen. Did, 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 did your performance and, and, and being circumcised, did it some kind of way connect you to the Spirit of God? Or did you receive the Spirit of God when uh, the Word pricked your heart and faith was brought alive in your heart? He said you received the Spirit by faith. You didn't receive it by doing something. You received it just because you allowed God to give it to you. Amen. So our assurance of salvation is when we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you want to know you're saved, if you've got the witness of the Holy Spirit, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you got a witness, a spiritual witness to the word of God, if you have a witness, a spiritual witness to the things of God, then that is your assurance of salvation. Amen. They receive this witness simply by believing that Christ died for our redemption, that he was buried and that he was risen from the grave and that when he rose again, he rose up with all power in his hands and that we are in him so now we are risen with him. This is how they receive the assurance of their salvation. They didn't receive it by being circumcised. There was no spiritual witness, amen, to performing a, spirit, a, a physical act. But the, the witness, the false witness, was the enemy, or in their own minds, the enemy working through them to convince them that they had something that they didn't really have. Okay. Let's go to verses 3 through 5. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, 
Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? He said you started out right. You started in the spirit, but now you're saying you're going to fall back on the works of the flesh to make you perfect? As far in God's sight, no. The only thing, amen, that makes us perfect is to have the spirit of God and to be yielded to the spirit of God because the only thing that's perfect is God. And he respects that which he has given to you. He does, there's nothing that you can really bring to him. The only thing we can do is submit. We can give him our heart. That's it. Amen. We can submit. That's the only thing that we can give him that he's going to have actual respect for. Because when we give him and accept him as Lord of our life, amen, then uh, uh, we are uh, receive of his spirit. And we walk according to his spirit. And that's what's pleasing to God. Okay. Verse 4 says, Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So he talks about himself. He said, A ministry that you receive. The, the ministry that was given to you, amen, it was a ministry done through the Spirit of God. You were ministered to according to the will of the Spirit. That was a witness because the Bible says that when the apostles, uh, uh, um, when they went out and witnessed, the Holy Ghost worked with them. And so the Holy Ghost working with them bore witness of God. And so he said, do, did he do it? Did I do it? Or he, did I do it by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Amen. Was, did the spirit minister to you because um, I had you to uh, be circumcised? Or was it through the hearing of faith or the receiving of what God gave you? Okay, to be made perfect means to be made mature as a saint of God. It doesn't mean that everything that you do is right. It means you are a mature, complete, saint, child, man or woman of God. We can only be matured in God by being indwelled by the Spirit of God and by allowing the indwelling Spirit of God to lead and guide us through life. Amen. When we are led according to the Spirit, we operate in life. When we are led by the flesh, we abide or we have our place or we live or we operate in death. Two different worlds, life and death. When Adam and Eve transgressed, they fell from life into death. Two different worlds. Uh, it, it, it's like me speaking English and you speaking Chinese. Amen. And I don't understand Chinese and you don't understand English. Two different worlds. That's why you got the children of light and the children of darkness. It's two different worlds. After Adam and Eve transgressed, God came to the garden and he asked Adam, where are you, Adam? He knew where Adam was physically, but Adam spiritually had fallen from grace. Amen. And so God knew that he had fallen from grace. And spiritually, Adam, you're not here with me. You used to be, but where are you now? Praise God. Okay. Amen. Now Paul is going to go on. Uh, he's already, he's given them the word of rebuke. And he's going to go on and explain to them to try to get them to see the ways that they have erred. So up until chapter 3, he's just established himself as an apostle. He's established uh, God Almighty as God. He's established the gospel as our saving grace. And in the rest of the book of Ephesians, what he's going to do is he's going to show them the ways that they have erred and the things that they have erred in. Okay, let's go to verses 6 and 7. He says this, Even as Abraham believed God, 
and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which of which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And they're the children of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham believed God. Amen. And it was accounted to him for righteousness or right standing. So belief in God is accounted to us as righteousness. Um, now his critics, the people who had come in after he had set the church up and uh, they had um, blasphemed against Paul, blasphemed his name. Um, what they did they used the law which was given by Moses and they tried to prove according to the law given by Moses that circumcision was necessary for salvation but what now Paul does here he doesn't go to he doesn't talk about Moses Paul goes past Moses all the way back to Abraham because Abraham came before Moses. Moses was a descendant of Abraham. And so his critics started with Moses and the law, but Paul goes back to Abraham and the covenant that God made with Abraham. That covenant was made before the law, before the law was ever thought of. Amen. Abraham was declared righteous because he believed God. So how in the world can uh, uh, the law make you be righteous? How in the world can them conforming to the circumcision cause them to be righteous? Amen. See, that's that's a major mistake they made. They started with Abraham. Okay, but Paul, he, he, he usurped them. He, over, he outdid them. Okay. Uh, very intelligent, very wise brother. Uh, amen. And we keep forgetting that Paul at one time was a student of the law that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, that he was, un, as far as him knowing the law, his knowledge could not be questioned. Amen. He was the high, high of the monkey mucks as far as the things of the law. But now this man is teaching grace. Praise God. Okay, remember that. For Paul to have the position that he once had and to have, matter of fact, he believed so strongly in the law that he was persecuting Christians uh, uh, who had converted from Judaism to Christianity. Paul, he believed that much in the law, but something had to cause this man of God to change. Amen. He would, if he had not been thoroughly convinced, uh, he would not preach grace. He would not have preached grace. So he was a hard, Paul was a hard joker. He was a hard man. But something had to happen. Amen. Just keep that in mind. Now, when we talk about Paul, remember what he used to be. Remember um, the, 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 the mindset that he did have. Amen. But after God has dealt with him, God has even called him up into heaven and given him revelation. Then he's a totally different mind. Okay. And so his critics, they used the law and they said, well, according to Moses, you know, uh, we have to be circumcised, and the circumcision is necessary for salvation. Amen. And yes, uh, uh, the law was given, or circumcision was given, but circumcision given under the law was given to the children of Israel to set them apart, to make them a unique and peculiar people to God. Amen. The law had nothing to do with the promise. The promise was made to Abraham. The law was given through Moses. The promise was made and many years later the law was given. Well, you know, and you can't say the promise didn't save because the Bible says that um, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So if you believe God, then you are put in right standing with God. To, uh, righteousness means to be in right standing. So Abraham was in right standing with God many years before Moses even came along. Okay, so the purpose of the law, and the law is a good thing. 
the purpose of the law was to show them the essence and the character of God himself. God himself was the law. I mean, all of those things, God was the fulfillment of everything that was in the law. But man could not fulfill. That was the problem. So the law was good because it was God's essence. It was him showing him, showing them exactly what he was. Amen. When he gave them the law, but they misunderstood it. And they told him, well, everything you said, we will do. And they messed up because, no, first of all, they got it wrong. Amen. You can't do everything I said. I'm showing you who I am. And I'm showing you that if you can fulfill this, this is what uh, uh, will make you like me, but you can't fulfill it. The whole thing, you can't fulfill it. If you could, you would be like me, but you can't. That's why you need my spirit. That was the whole purpose. And the whole purpose was to actually show them that they could not fulfill it. And so they could not be like God unless they had the spirit of God dwelling in them. Amen. So it was uh, 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 the purpose was also to make them aware of the separation between uh, God and man. It was to make them aware of how far away that they were from God. Amen. It was to make them aware of how much they fell short of God. Um, so, but they missed it. They, they thought that, okay, I can do this and be like God. And see, that's the same uh, uh, bill of sale that Satan sold to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So the devil works the same way that he's always worked. Amen. And uh, circumcision was a right. It was designed to set them apart as children of God. It was a mark made in the flesh because uh, uh, they did not yet have the indwelling spirit of God. And so God had to make a mark in the flesh that set them apart. Uh, today, our mark that we have is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. This is the mark that shows the demons and the devils that we belong to God and they have no access. It's like the blood. Remember the Passover ritual. In the Old Testament, before the children of Israel left Egypt, the night that they were delivered, they celebrated the Passover. And each house uh, um, of, of the Hebrew people, they had to put blood on the doors, on the front of the house, on the front of the door, and on the side of the door. And when the death angel saw the house and he saw the blood, he could not enter that house to kill that firstborn. Well, it's the same thing now, but our mark now is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not necessarily a physical mark. It is a spiritual mark. And Satan does the same thing with his people. Uh, when the tribulation comes, what the Antichrist will do, he's going to require his people to take the mark of the beast. And what does that mark do? Well, it just sets apart his people. And it shows that those that have that mark belong to him. Well, we who belong to God, we have the spirit of God dwelling in us. Amen. Those that belong to Satan in the, in the tribulation, you know, he's going to declare himself to be God and he's going to mark his people. Amen. But now, notice, his mark would be a physical mark. Our mark is a spiritual mark. Why? Because he cannot give life. God is the spirit of life. And so when we are indwelled by him, amen, we have life. Satan can't give life, so he can't do anything for our spirit. Amen. He can only uh, uh, inhabit us. He can inhabit the bodies or whatever, but he can't give life. And so the mark that he's going to have to give during the tribulation it's going to have to be something which is physical and maybe probably something that is visible. But devils know those who are gods because um, they see his presence in our lives. They see his spirit in our lives. Amen. And they know that they don't have access to us. 
Uh, remember the uh, seven sons of Sceva when they tried to cast out a demon and the demon told him. He said, Jesus I know and Paul I know but who are you? Because they did not belong to God and that devil would. Amen. And so you can uh, um, rejoice in the fact that being a child of God and being indwelled with the spirit of God then the enemy knows you and he fears you. You might not be aware that he fears you like a lot of us are not. A lot of saints don't realize that the enemy actually fears us because he, he fears the God that is in us. But he knows who you are and he fears who you are. Now that's not going to stop him or prevent him from coming against you because he will take whatever opening uh, that he sees that you allow him to have. And you know when he um, tempted Job when the devil came at Job and God asked him where had he been and he told him to and fro well Satan had watched Job and he had looked into find some kind of way that he could get into Job's life and he just didn't see it amen and the same with you and I if we have the spirit of God and if we are totally obedient to that indwelling Holy Spirit, then there's absolutely nothing that the enemy can do to come against us. Amen. So now the criteria has not changed. We have the same criteria uh, to be declared righteous or, or to have righteousness accounted to us as Abraham had. Abraham, the Bible says, Abraham believed God. And then the Bible says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, then we shall be saved. And I'm going to tell you that if you truly believe in your heart, you will confess with your mouth. There's no ifs, no ands, or buts about it. And confessing with your mouth doesn't necessarily mean that you get up in the pulpit and preach a sermon. But, amen, your conversation or the way that you carry yourself will show. Praise God. You can't have him and, 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 and hold him and bottle him up and keep him in a bottle. If you have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, every time the Holy Ghost appears, he makes noise. And the places where he appeared in the Bible, every time he, pe he appeared, he made noise. On the day of Pentecost. Uh, when he came and he sat on those people in the upper room, what did they do? They started praising God and speaking in tongues. Amen. When he appeared at Mount Sinai, even though uh, uh, he couldn't touch the people or the people couldn't touch him, but the Bible tells about the voices that came out of the mountain. Okay. Amen. Jesus said that uh, when Abraham saw his day, he rejoiced. And the Spirit of God, if we have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will rejoice in that which comes forth from God. I think James, either James or John says that in their epistle, that if you have the, Jesus is the Son of God, what, what the apostle says, and if we have the Spirit of God, we will love the things of God. And if Jesus is the Son, he came out of the Father, we cannot say that we have the Spirit of God and don't accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior or don't love Jesus because Jesus came from the Father. The Spirit in you loves everything that comes from the Father and the Spirit in you bears witness to the Father. Um, when Jesus said that Abraham saw his day, I want to just talk about that a little bit. Amen. So I'm going to hit this thing real good. I'm going to hit it real good. Man, I'm going to hit it, and we're going to hit everything we can. And I know after I finish, God is going to show me something that I didn't hit. But I'm going to do, we're going to make it do what it do. I want to talk about uh, when Jesus said that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. And if you look in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 22 and verse 4, it gives the account of when Abraham uh, was prepared to sacrifice Isaac and it says this then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off and Abraham said unto his young men abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship 
and come again to you. Why did Abraham tell his men that he and Isaac would go and worship and come back when he knew that he was supposed to sacrifice Isaac as a sacrifice when he got there? And the place that he saw on the third day was Calvary. When he saw the place of far off, this is, this is not him seeing through his natural vision. This is something God is showing him in the spirit realm. The place that Abraham saw was uh, Jesus Christ's sacrifice on Mount Calvary. Amen. That's the place that he saw. And he knew that, okay, for, for God to sacrifice his son, he wants me to sacrifice Isaac. And if I sacrifice Isaac, he will sacrifice his son, but his son will be the savior of the world. But Isaac is the door that's going to open this blessing. Me sacrificing Isaac is going to be the door that will open up the blessing. But he knew or he saw that Jesus Christ would be raised from the dead. That's why he said, I and Isaac, we're going to go and weep are going to come back. Amen. Praise God. Okay. And I want to verify that uh, by looking at the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, just to verify or, or to give a witness to what I just said, because Scripture will bear witness with Scripture. Amen. So whatever we learn or whatever we read, it, there's always something, there's a Scripture that bears witness. This is how you know that you are uh, uh, in the word of God. And Romans chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 bears witness. And it says this. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So, he said if he was justified by works, yeah, he, it, that's something he can talk about, something he can brag about, something he can glory in, but he can't glory before God. There's nothing he can tell God. There's nothing, uh, uh, no reward for that or no respect for that with God. Amen. He may have graduated at the top of his class. He may have been magna cum laude or whatever it is. And that's something that he, could, he can glory in but it doesn't mean anything to God. So that's, this is what Paul is saying. Okay, let me go back to Galatians chapter 3, and uh, we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In these shall all nations be blessed. So now what Paul is doing, he's making a case to make them understand that they are saved by grace and not by the works of the law. He says, and the scripture, look at his exact words here. He says, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The scriptures foresaw or saw ahead of time or predicted that one way, one day rather, God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Amen. And so this is what happened uh, when he made the promise in Abraham. And he said, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And remember, this is uh, the promise that was given over 400 years before the law was given. Okay. The written word of God is the very essence of God. And if the scripture foresaw that all men would be justified by faith, then it was God's intention, beloved, to justify all men by faith. And if the scripture foresaw it, if the scripture said it and showed it ahead of the law being given, ahead of time, then it was God's intention from the very beginning to do it that way. Okay. Um, Hebrews 11, 18 and 19 verifies what we just said or it adds a little bit of weight 
of what we just said about Abraham. And I read that. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall all thy seed be called according that God was able or accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure so what is the author saying here he's saying that Abraham uh, uh, knew that God would use his sacrifice to be a blessing to him or to the world and then it says in verse 19 accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead why would he account again that God was able to raise up Isaac from the, from the dead because God showed him uh, the future and he showed him in that future that Jesus Christ would be sacrificed and raised from the dead and that's what Paul means when he says here from whence he also received him in a figure. Well, what does that mean? He received him in a figure. It means God gave him a vision of what was going to happen. Amen. And that's how Abraham knew. Okay. Praise God. Now, to show you another thing, the faith that Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac came from God. Amen. But now you notice the work of sacrificing Isaac was never completed. Ah, so Abraham was justified by faith. When he was ready to go ahead with that sacrifice, he demonstrated his faith. God didn't need him to go through with it. He just needed him to demonstrate his faith. Praise God. Okay. So God did not intend for circumcision as these false teachers had taught to become a badge of honor amen uh, uh, something um, that that made people right in him but he intended for the circumcision to point to him amen it was a mark uh, designed to set his people aside and it was a prelude to the circumcision of the heart and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So it was a type of what was to come. It was a shadow of what was to come. Okay. Let me go down. Let me go back to Galatians. Amen. And let me go to verse 10. Uh, we're going to do 10 through 14. One verse at a time. Verse 10. For as many as, uh, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So now Paul tells them what he's telling them is, Beloved, what you all have done, you have reverted back to keeping the law and you have listened to this false doctrine and by you doing this you have put yourself under a curse amen and that's exactly what the enemy does that's what he did with adam and eve when they listened to him it caused them to fall and to lose their place and to fall from grace and the thing about it is that they knew something was wrong because the Bible says they realized they were naked. Amen. Okay. And so it's, it shows that they had fallen from grace. And they had willfully fallen because they willfully obeyed the enemy. Okay. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And so God, uh, Paul rather, says those who are justified in the sight of God are those who live according to faith. Verse 12, and the law is not faith, but the man that doeth them 
shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. As it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. Amen. So our promise is of the Spirit. Praise God. Through faith, we receive the promise of the Spirit. Amen. Not through the keeping of the law of Moses, but through the faith in the promise that was made to Abraham, which was made 430 years before the law was ever thought of, praise God, are we saved. And the reason that we were saved by faith, through faith, is because God would also save the Gentiles. Okay, he said no man can be justified by what he supposes to be adherence to the law. And now, let me say something now. Let me say something. Good works don't save you, but if you are saved, you will do good works. Good works is a byproduct of your salvation. If you take on, if you are saved, then your character should begin to change into God's character. Amen. And we should begin to have the mind that Christ had. And so good works follow salvation. Good works will follow salvation. Praise God. You know, you can't, uh, 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 you can't get bitter fruit from a, 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 a sweet plant. Uh, you can't grow lemons and apples together. A tree is either a lemon tree or an apple tree. And so if we are saved, our good works will be evidence. Amen. But the good works are just evidence of salvation. They're, they're the fruit of salvation. Praise God. They are the result of salvation. Uh, they're the product of salvation. It's not good works that save us. We don't do good works to get saved. We do good works because we are saved. Okay, good works will definitely follow. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Good works will definitely follow if you believe on the Lord Jesus and confess him with, uh, uh, on him with your mouth. Good works will follow those that truly believe. Amen. You can tell a tree, they say you can tell a tree by the fruit that it bears. Praise God. Whatever is in that sap. Whatever DNA is in that tree is going to produce the fruit on the outside of that tree. Amen. Okay. Let's go to verses 15 and 16. Paul still talking to the Galatians, still attempting to convince them and to bring them back under the gospel. He's laying down the foundation of the gospel. He's doing that work of an apostle. He's laying down that foundation Amen. To bring them back on that foundation of Jesus Christ. They've drifted a little bit. The enemy has come in and tried to tear it up. Amen. But the man of God is doing an excellent job of using the truth of the word of God to bring them back on point. Verses 15 and 16. Verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed... No man disannulleth or uh, added thereto. I'm going to say something on that verse right there. He says, I speak after the manner of men. Um, another way of saying this, you know, this is written in, in, in Old English, King James English. But in modern English, if I were to tell you this and I, and I would say, brother, I speak after the manner of men. I would say something like, look here, man, let me break it down to you in real terms, in everyday life. So what he's saying is, let me break it down to you so you can understand it. Let me speak uh, 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 and break it down as far as life is concerned. Let me speak after the manner of men. Then he says, um, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. What is he saying? He's talking about an agreement between two people. He's not even talking about a covenant with God, right? He's saying a man's covenant. So if you and I make an agreement, amen, and we confirm that agreement, and we shake hands, well, shaking hands doesn't work nowadays, but we draw up paperwork and sign and say we're going to abide by that agreement, 
then the agreement is made. So I can't come back and change it out of my own mind. I can't come back because I changed my mind and said, I'm going to change the agreement and it's going to be different now because I don't feel like doing it that way. He said, even with men, he said that, that, that no man disannul it. I don't take it away. To disannul means to just take it away. I don't disannul it and I don't add anything to it. It is what it is. It's what we said. And what he said to Abraham, and then he says, now to Abraham and his seeds were the promise made. And so he's using that example to say, look, the promise was made to Abraham. And it was made to his seeds. And then he says, and he said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So now he's talking about the covenant that God made. He, he uses the one between men to say, even if it's something an agreement that's made between men nobody can come back and change that nobody can come back and add anything nobody can come back and say well i don't feel like doing it this way and he's saying that's not what god did amen god didn't justify abraham and then come back and tell moses you got to be justified another way amen god is not if men don't do it god ain't gonna do it so he said to now to abraham and his seed were the promises made he said, not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So, he's speaking of this relationship. Uh, he brings up this covenant again that was made with God. And the fact that it was made with God and not to a man makes it superior to anything that men can think of. Amen. It is far superior to any deal that two men can ever make. Because many times men make deals. And when it doesn't work out, you know, for, for my benefit the way I thought it would, then I'll break the deal. And big companies do that all the time. Uh, these big, big retailers, Walmart does it all the time. And their tactic is... They got lawyers on their payroll. They got enough money. They, got, they have lawyers that work for them. And if they make an agreement with you and they decide that it's not working out in their best interest, they just won't do it. And yeah, they're wrong, but they know that you can't take them to court. Amen. If you take them to court, you're not going to have the finances required to see it through. And that's how they do business. But thank God that's not the way that he does business. Amen. Okay. Okay. So now, since the seed is Christ, the covenant is God the Father talk, making a covenant with God the Son, who is God himself. So he's making that agreement. That agreement is so strong, he's making it through Abraham with himself praise God that's what Paul is saying he said the seed is Christ he said so God made the covenant and he said in the covenant that the seed would be blessed but then uh, 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 Paul goes back and says that seed is Christ okay what does Paul what is he trying to do Paul is trying to eliminate the schism that exists between the Hebrew people or the Jewish people and the Gentile people. He's trying to show them and point out in this epistle that there is one body of Christ. It might be composed of different nationalities of people. It might be composed of different races of people, but the body is one body. And you remember when we talked about him earlier, I think it was in chapter 2, where he rebuked Peter at Antioch. And the reason he rebuked Peter was because Peter chose to separate himself. When he got with other Jews, he chose to separate himself from the Gentiles. And Paul rebuked him. He said, I rebuke him to the face because at that particular point, he had to rebuke Peter that way because he had to keep the record straight. If he had not rebuked Peter... If he had not corrected that thing, then in the, in the mind of all of those Jewish people, when they saw Peter uh, pull away, and they would have thought that it was okay to do. 
Amen. And that's not the foundation that Paul wants the church to be founded in. That's not the type schism that needs to come in right in the founding of the church. It doesn't need to come in at all, but especially uh, when the church is being established. And so this is why he chose to rebuke P Peter openly, because by doing that, he let everybody else know at the same time, no, you, no, 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 no. You can't, how are you going to separate yourself uh, uh, from the other men of your body and think that because you are this and that you are so much more than anybody else? Okay, let's go to verses 17 and, eight, and 18. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. So what he's saying, he's saying that Abraham, amen, uh, when he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness, and God did not come back 430 years later and say, okay, no, we're not going to do that now. We're going to do it this way. This is what he's saying. Okay. Um, verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Praise God. Okay, so God didn't promise something and then change his mind and say, no, I'm not going to give it to you like I said. Now you're going to have to do this to get it. Praise God. God didn't change his mind. Okay, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added, okay, so now I like the way he's asking this question. Remember, Paul used to be a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul was the high bucket and muck. Paul knew everything about Amen, uh, the Old Testament. He knew, he, he knew it forwards and backwards, man. He could probably do it in his sleep. He could probably recite the entire uh, uh, volume of scriptures at that time. But he's asking this question because I know it's a question that he had in his own mind when the Lord dealt with him. And he asked, and he's a, a good teacher, you're going to anticipate this, this, this question. He's anticipating what's in people's mind. And so people are saying, okay, well then what's the purpose of the law? Okay, he says, wherefore the servant? Paul says it was added because of transgressions to the seed should become to whom the promise was made. And so, in other words, Paul said it was added to try to keep people on track to make them understand, amen, that they did not have the essence of God because the law was the essence of God. It was God telling them who he was, but they didn't have it. And so he's saying that God had to do this to make people aware of their transgressions because if there's no law, then there's no penalty. Amen. If I am in my car and I'm driving on the Autobahn in Germany, there's no speed limit. If my car will drive 180 miles an hour, praise God, I'm free to drive 180 miles an hour. But in the United States, if I do that, I'm going to jail. Praise God. If I do that, I'm going to jail. So the law was added to show the transgressions and to make men understand that they could not be like God in their flesh. Amen. Men, people wanted to be like God. They thought that by doing this, just like Satan told Adam and Eve, he said, the day, he said, you will be like God. Amen. The day you do this, you will be like God. Not so. The only thing, again, that can make us like God is to be possessed with the Spirit of God. Amen. As he works in our lives and teaches us the things of God. And before the Spirit of God came, uh, uh, Paul says the law was like a schoolmaster. Um, in the ancient days, during the, the Greeks and the Romans, what they used to do, the ones that had money, a lot of times they would hire people to watch after their children, to discipline their children, and to train their children until they could come of age. And so when he calls the law a schoolmaster, this is what he's saying. Okay. Praise God. Okay. Now, 
Paul talks about the law being ministered by angels. He talks about the difference between the two covenants uh, when they were given. He talks about uh, the administration uh, being ministered by, ang by angels. Amen. And uh, he talked about the different covenants. When he talks about the law being ministered by angels, what he's doing is he's making a difference. He's showing the difference uh, in administration, amen, to Abraham and the administration through Moses. Uh, when that covenant was administered through Moses, that same day, it was violated because the people could not keep it. And as a result of that, on that day, 3,000 people died or had to be killed because they transgressed against the law. Amen. They transgressed, and, and so it caused death to come among the people. Um, so now, it just demonstrates that it could not give life. But grace came through the sacrifice of the Son of God. Life was given through the sacrifice of the Son of God. His death brought the prospect and the hope of eternal life to the entire world. Amen. And many people have been saved and ushered into eternal life through the preaching of the gospel. When Peter preached his first sermon in the book of Acts, there were 3,000 people who were saved. Amen. And so now you see, you see the difference. 3,000 being killed and 3,000 being saved. And that's not an accident because God doesn't do anything by accident. Okay, let's look at verses 20 through 22. Verse 20 says this. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Okay, so now what point is Paul making? Let's figure out what a mediator is and then we can understand the point that Paul is making. A mediator is a third person who makes communication between two other people when it comes to making an agreement. For example, in the, in the natural world, when you buy a house, you purchase a property, normally that purchase would be done through a relator. The relator is not the owner of that property, but the relator is the mediator, okay? So that mediator is a third person, and what that relator does is connects you. He knows or she knows what the seller wants, and he or she knows what the buyer is willing to do. And so what that relator does is try to mediate to get the seller and the buyer on the same terms so that the transaction can be made. Same thing when you purchase a car and you go into a dealership to purchase that automobile, you deal with a salesman who's the mediator and the little game that he plays or that they play with you, he's, he's, he, you know, when you're, you're working on the deal and he'll tell you, well, I gotta go ask my boss, you know, that's just a game, but nevertheless, he's a mediator. Amen. And so Moses, uh, Paul says, was a mediator in the law, in giving the law. But let's look at Abraham. When Abraham sacrificed Isaac, there was no mediator. God himself made a covenant. God himself uh, 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 laid the animals out. God himself walked through the blood of the animals that he laid out for Abraham. So there was no mediator. It was God himself who dealt directly with Abraham. Amen. The covenant that God himself made was ratified through God in the flesh. Amen. So God made the covenant and then he put on a body of flesh and he ratified the covenant. So now there was no mediator 
for grace to come. Praise God. There's no flesh involved. Amen. Except for the, the other party or the lesser party, which was uh, Abraham. Okay, so men are justified uh, uh, by faith. Once again, the, he, the, the, the circumcision was just a, a, a mark that alerted the Hebrew people that set them apart that they were a separate and peculiar people to God until the time of the promise could come, the promise being Jesus Christ. And so before that promise came, amen, they had to be marked by circumcision to show that they were a peculiar people to God. But our circumcision now is done when we accept the salvation of Christ and it is a circumcision of the heart. And the heart is not talking about that thing in your chest, but it's speaking of your spirit. Praise God. When the Holy Spirit comes in, amen, he delivers you, he cleanses you, he sets you apart from God. Praise God. And so now that is your circumcision. Okay. Amen. Let's look at 1 Timothy. I want to show you something. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 it says this so knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man who is a righteous man a righteous man is a man who is in right standing with God it says but it is made of, well, but for the lawless the disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for man slayers. Why? Because they need an external law, because they're not guided by the internal law. Amen. They're not ruled by the Spirit of God. Their heart is not ruled by the Spirit of God. And so they need something external that's going to try to keep a leash on that flesh. Praise God. Okay, let's go back to Galatians. Galatians 3 verses 23 through 29. I believe this is that's probably going to finish us up. Paul says this. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Didn't he say faith came with Abraham? He said Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that's faith. Abraham's faith made him be accounted. But right here he said, before faith came, we were kept under the law. Didn't the law come after uh, 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 Moses? So what is he talking about? Before faith came. Amen. It seems like a contradiction. Um, you know, he's already said Abraham was justified by faith. But now he's talking about before faith came, we were under the law. But the law came after Abraham was justified. The faith that came after Abraham was justified, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. He's speaking of the Comforter, which was released to the world uh, for us uh, when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Why is it faith? Because the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our faith, is our assurance that we are children of God. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance is real. All right, this bottle of water. I have in my hand. It's got substance in there. Amen. Substance is real. So you, as a child of God, are indwelt with that substance. That substance being the Spirit of God. Amen. It's the substance, praise God, of things hoped for. What are we hoping for? Redemption. The Bible says that he is the earnest of our redemption. He's the promise. He's the engagement ring. Amen. That's going to be later followed by a wedding ring. Amen. He's the promise of our redemption. This is the faith that he's talking about. And he says the evidence of things not seen. 
we don't see God, but we have his spirit living in us. That's the evidence to us. That's the reassurance to us. That's our comfort to us that there is a God and that we belong to him. And so this is the faith that he's talking about uh, that the scripture foresaw that, amen, the Gentiles would also be saved. Praise God. This is the thing that saves us. This is the faith that saves us. But he says, before faith, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. And so the law, praise God, was, a, was also evidence of that which was to be revealed. The Bible, uh, well, not the Bible, but uh, the, the law was types and shadows. You know, the, the law is referred to as types and shadows of the thing which was to come. So it was also evidence, amen, of that which was to be revealed, but it could not say. Okay, verse 24 says, whereof the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So it showed us the way, amen, of uh, the way and the justification is by Christ But the law showed us the way Amen The law was good Praise God It was not There was nothing evil Except the law was the essence of God himself It was that thing which he was That they at that particular time Could not be Until the coming of the spirit of God Until that indwelling of the spirit of God And then verse 25 says this But after that faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster because we are under that faith which has come. The Spirit of God will never, ever, ever lead us to do anything that is contrary to the nature or the essence of God. So if I be led of the Spirit, amen, then there is no condemnation. I'm not under any condemnation. Praise God as long as I'm led by the Spirit of God. Okay. Amen. So the law of Moses served to introduce the essence of God. It was introduced initially on written stones, but eventually it was written into the hearts of men. Praise God so that I am governed by it the indwelling presence of God Almighty. Okay, let's look at verses 26 through 29. And he says this, he ends up on a good note. He, he's, he's rebuked, you know, he's done his rebuke. He's kind of called them out. He's gotten their attention. Uh, he's kind of beat them up a little bit, not much, but he beat them up in love. He didn't, he didn't do it in, in a hateful attitude. He did it in love. He did it in a very loving manner. He did it, did what he needed to do to open their eyes and to help them see uh, uh, some of the things that they did not see. Okay, let's look at verses 26 through 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And what was that faith? Remember he said the faith was to come and that was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost that was released when Jesus ascended. And so by him, uh, uh, we are children of God. By being indwelled with the spirit of God, it makes us children of God. Amen. Uh, uh, we're, 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 we're engaged. The wedding hasn't taken place yet, but we've received our engagement ring. Okay. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And this is what he's saying. He's not talking necessarily about being baptized by water. But he's talking about being baptized in the spirit of God. He said baptized into Christ. Christ is the anointing. Amen. Not water. Not necessarily water. Water baptism is necessary. But this is not what he's talking about. He says for as many of you as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That identifies you. If you put on Christ, that identifies you as a child of Christ or a child of God. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is either male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We are one how? Through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Uh, one way that the Apostle Peter said it 
he said that we are all living stones built up into a spiritual house. Now, there's a difference between a regular stone and a living stone. A living stone is a stone which is possessed by the Spirit of God. And through the Spirit of God, we are built up into a spiritual house. So in God, there is neither Jew, there is neither Greek, there is neither bond, there is neither free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. Remember, uh, Jesus said that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Praise God. If you are a child of God, you will rejoice in the things of God. If you are not a child of God, amen, you will reject the things of God. And this is, um, we remember, this is one of the things that Jesus told the Pharisees. He said, no, you're of your father, the devil. Um, and that's when he told them, he said, well, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. So if we are children of God, whatever God does, it's going to be good with us. So if God decide to, to save the world by his son, guess what? We're going to rejoice. Why? Because we bear witness with our God Almighty who is in heaven. Amen. I certainly hope you have enjoyed it. I certainly thank everybody uh, who's listened to me. Uh, I saw your names, everybody on uh, um, Facebook, everybody in Radio Land. God bless you. I love you with the love of Jesus Christ. And until the next time that you hear my voice, or uh, until the next time that you see my face, I certainly hope and pray that those days are the best days of your life. And until next Wednesday, amen, unless the Lord says otherwise, I will see you then.